Hey, brother! Then I have seen a Fantastic Beast twice now, which you know because you saw it with me both times, and I have to say, it is awesome. In fact, I feel comfortable saying that, hands down, by a mile, it is the best Harry Potter movie. Yeah, I said it. But having seen it twice, it does leave you with a few unanswered questions. So today, I'm counting down the top seven unanswered questions from Fantastic Beasts and where to find them. Quick warning, if you have not seen the movie, this video will have spoilers. You have been warned. These are in no particular order, so we'll just kick it off right here. Number seven, who is Newt's brother? This question stems from a very brief line from the crowd of wizards in the Makuza after Newt emerges from his case. Everyone starts asking, oh my god, who is that? Someone says Scamander, the war hero, and then someone else corrects them saying, no, it's his little brother. To clarify, the war they're talking about is World War I, like the actual world war, not the first wizarding war with Voldemort because, well, that just hasn't happened yet. But the real reason this piqued our interest is because earlier in the movie when Newt is talking to Kowalski, he definitely has like an elevated level of interest when he learns that Kowalski fought in the war. But even upon learning this, he doesn't bring up his brother, so it leaves us wondering, what is that relationship like? In an interview with Colin Farrell, who played Percival Graves in this movie, he revealed that Newt's brother's name is Theseus, and that Theseus had corresponded with Graves at some point. Now what's interesting about the name Theseus is that in Greek mythology, one of the things Theseus is most famous for is slaying the Minotaur, which I would bet would classify as a fantastic beast. And if you've seen the movie, I think you would agree, Newt would definitely not approve of such behavior. Now I doubt it's that Theseus or that this Theseus has also slain a Minotaur, but I don't think the connection can be ignored. And the fact that he is considered a war hero suggests that he is good at or at least okay with violence. And since Newt doesn't bring him up, I'm betting they don't have a great relationship, but definitely bet we also meet him eventually. And further complicating that situation is that we know Theseus corresponded with Graves, but we don't know whether that was like with Grindel Graves or with like actual regular Percival Graves, which brings us to number six. What happened to the real Percival Graves? My first thought at the end of the movie when Grindelwald reveals himself was, how did he do that? Like, you know, like conceal his identity. There are three ways we are aware of that a wizard might do this. The first is maybe Grindelwald is a metamorph magi, like, Tonks was, meaning he can just change his appearance at will. And while that seems like it could be the case, I really doubt it because I feel like we would just already know that about Grindelwald. The second possibility is that he has just transfigured his entire body to look different. Kind of like what Ron does at the end of the Deathly Hallows when they're breaking into Gringotts. Now, Ron only like gives himself facial hair and like a different nose and he does look sort of different but not a ton, so I don't know if it would be that effective. But then I also think Grindelwald is way more talented than like Ron and Harry and Hermione at that point in their life, so he's probably in that top tier of wizards who could completely transfigure his entire body if he wanted to. But the most likely thing he was doing was using Polyjuice Potion to assume the identity of the actual Percival Graves. And I say that's the most likely option because producer David Heyman actually said in an interview that's what was happening. Someone used some Polyjuice Potion and, and, and took their place. But it's not like we saw Graves actually drinking anything the whole movie, so there is some room there for them to change their minds if they want to. But I kind of hope it was Polyjuice Potion because that would mean that the real Percival Graves is still out there somewhere. Grindelwald would have had to have kept him alive so we could keep using his DNA in the potion, and it means that Colin Farrell could come back in the next movie, and I loved him in this one, so I hope that's what happens. And speaking of people coming back, that brings us to number five. How slash just will Kowalski remember everything? Easily the saddest point in the whole movie is when Jacob walks out into the rain, voluntarily wiping his own memory. But then, just before the credits roll, we see Queenie visit him at the bakery. She he smiles at him and he returns the smile and also reaches for the spot on his neck where he was bitten earlier in the movie, suggesting that he does remember something. Plus, all of the pastries he's making are shaped 
shaped like the Fantastic Beasts, which he also should have forgotten. Or should he? Remember, the city's memory wasn't wiped by a memory charm. It was wiped by Swooping Death Thunderbird Rain Serum. Very different, highly experimental. Kind of a miracle it worked at all, actually. But one of the things we noticed upon the second viewing is that while Newt is extracting the serum, he explains that when diluted properly, it could have properties that wipe bad memories. This works great on everyone who sees the city being destroyed by magic as a bad thing, but Kowalski has been nothing but fascinated with magic the entire movie. So while yes, it does look like some of his memory was erased, it looks like he had enough good memories that there's still something there. Speaking of bad memories, number four, what happened to Lita Lestrange. We don't learn a whole lot about her other than at some point her and Newt were possibly romantically involved, but then people change. Either way, he still carries a photo of her around and I have a feeling we will see her in a future film, if for no other reason than that otherwise they cast Zoe Kravitz to be in a picture for like two seconds for like no reason. Also, her last name is Lestrange, which has all sorts of negative connotations, as in Bellatrix Lestrange. But keep in mind, Bellatrix marries into that name, so technically Lita is not a blood relative of Bellatrix, nor is she necessarily even a bad person, but I'm kind of betting that she is. Mostly based on the reaction Queenie has upon learning the name. She doesn't quite finish her thought, but it doesn't seem like it was going to be a good one. My personal guess is that if they were romantically involved, their breakup had something to do with why Newt was expelled from Hogwarts. Which brings us to question three. Why is Newt allowed a wand, but Hagrid isn't? Both were apparently expelled for possession of a dangerous magical creature, but Hagrid has his wand snapped and is never allowed to do magic again, while Newt, on the other hand, is instead commissioned to write a book and gets to travel the entire world studying his favorite thing, which also just so happens to be Hagrid's favorite thing. What kind of weird rule is this? You were expelled from school, you're never allowed to do magic again. Be like if we muggles were expelled from school, they're like, well, sorry, you have to leave the country. Side note, my personal guess for the dangerous creature Newt had was none other than the giant squid in the lake at Hogwarts. We even see Newt carrying around a small but still kind of large squid-like creature inside his case at one point. The point is Hagrid got a raw deal, but while we're on the subject of Hagrid, I think I've decided I'm going to start collecting Hagrid toys. Check it out, I've already got two. And I found this awesome Euro Wizard Harry shirt the other day, but it turns out it's way too small. And a girl shirt, so. Moving on. Picked a bad day to wear a lot of layers. Number two, did Credence really die? So the end of the movie, Credence is hit with like a bazillion spells while in his obscurest form and just explodes, apparently dying, but it's not entirely clear. So first, let's just go over everything we know about the Obscurus and Obscurial. The Obscurus is a parasitic magical force that develops inside of a witch or wizard when they try and repress their magical power. Power. A witch or wizard who has developed an Obscurus is known as an Obscurial. Normally, an Obscurus kills its host by the time they've reached age 10, and it is believed that the Obscurus cannot survive without a host to feed off of. Credence, however, has managed to not only survive well past age 10, but appears to have some amount of control over the Obscurus and can like take on its form to wreak havoc upon the city and uses it to kill Senator Shaw. Until he is eventually trapped in the subway where he is defeated by the Makuza and just dissipates out in to black dust. Or does he? Most of him does seem to just sort of fade away, but we do see Newt staring after one final piece of blackness that does seem to still be moving of its own accord. It seems clear to me that just not everything is known about Obscurus yet, so the question is, did Credence himself survive, or did maybe just his Obscurus that's seeking out a new host? Which brings us to our final question, number one, 
who is Credence's mother? Very little is known about Credence's upbringing other than that he is actually a very super powerful wizard who was raised by a super wizard hating woman, Mary Lou Barebone. Mary does say his mother was a wicked unnatural woman, suggesting that she was a witch and maybe that Mary herself had something to do with her death. But the fact that his parents are dead is obvious because you know, he's an orphan. So why bring up his mother at all to like us, the audience. I mean, who was she? First, this seemed like a daunting question because we just don't know of that many like old American wizards. But we do know of some, and if those are the only ones we have to choose from, well, kind of narrows the field for us. Because really, the only other people we know a lot about are none other than the founders of Ilvermorny. And you can see a whole video about them by clicking the card. Two of the founders, Isolt and James, were married. The other two founders were their adopted sons. But along with their adopted sons, they had two biological twin daughters, Martha and Renok. Renok never had kids because she didn't want to extend the family line. Dot, dot, dot. Martha, on the other hand, was a squib. She married a nomad and lived a pretty ordinary life, and whether or not she had kids is actually unknown. But I think she did, and that Credence is actually descendant from her. Graves even says, I can smell squib on you. Meaning, he is a descendant of the line her sister tried to avoid extending. She tried to avoid this because the whole family are descendants from the Gaunts. And therefore, wait for it, Salazar Slytherin. Enemies of the air? Beware. Super powerful descendant of Slytherin growing up in an orphanage barely surviving death sound familiar? But there you go. Those are our top seven unanswered questions from Fantastic Beasts. Or actually, I should say those are seven of the top eight. Those were in no particular order, but number one was definitely number one. That video will be on Thursday. But until then, if you had any other questions from Fantastic Beasts that you'd like us to investigate, please let us know in the towel section down below. These socks are amazing! Guys, thanks for watching. As always, please like this video if you haven't already, and subscribe so you don't miss any future Harry Potter content. After Thursday, you can be able to click right here to see the video I was just talking about. But until then, if you want to know all about the history of magic in North America, I recommend you check out this video right here. But Ben, that's all I've got for you today, man. I will see you in another life, brother.